continuing on, the developmental model posits that uh, individuals develop addictive use disorders due to traumas, vulnerability, um, lack of meeting developmental milestones. So essentially, um, you know, we we develop at various points and in various different ways and for various different things throughout our entire life. And early childhood has some pretty monumental stages that can forever change or cement who we are, how we be, how we deal and how we are, and just how, how we are as humans um, and adults, uh, if, if not successfully navigated. So what that means is, let's say you are, you have a traumatic event during your childhood, and if you were never, if you never learned or were shown or engaged in healthy coping mechanism, then the coping mechanism that you used, which was unhealthy because you were never shown healthy, is going to be what you continue to use. Um, so if you can apply this to addictions, and some of you guys noted this in your assignment last week, if you have learned a healthy way of uh, excuse me, an unhealthy way of coping, that's going to be how you cope. So using substances to cope is your unhealthy way. Um, and so they posit that, you know, these these missed sort of developmental milestones or opportunities could potentially explain the reason why one would continue to use. Um, it, it's, it's, it's how they know to be and how they know to cope. And, um, and you know what's interesting is that you know there's a lot of research in our field on how important development and de development through the lifespan is on an individual that this is a pretty valuable way of explaining addiction treatment and quite frankly this is one of the it, no, this is the way of explaining that I use primarily it would be unethical and just not accurate for me to say that this is the only way to explain it, but this is a pretty big way of explaining addictions uh, and addiction, addictive use disorders. Um, so let me know, I, you know, I'm interested in having conversations about your thoughts on this. I'm going to show you guys a video in a couple of weeks that really dives into this as well. So um, I'm taking a little bit of time to spend here because I think this is a, a pretty progressive and contemporary view of addiction treatment and kind of, for the most part, what we use now. This is definitely something that I use now as an explanation. Um, biological models. This primarily says that you are biologically predisposed to have an addictive use disorder. We know based on research that if you have an addictive use disorder, you more oftentimes than not have someone in your family who also has an addictive use disorder. So, and we can see some sort of biological changes within your brain that reflect this genetic component. However, what's lacking is that chicken or an egg piece. What came first? Was it the substances that are causing these biological changes in your brain? And then going even further, if your parent has an addictive use disorder, how were they parenting? And those parenting techniques that your uh, that the individual who has an addictive use disorder is using on their children could certainly change brain chemistry and brain makeup, which may also make the individual uh, be more likely to have an addictive use disorder. Also, if you're um, if you go back to sort of the, those um, other approaches like cognitive behavioral, some learned ways of being may come into play when we're talking about biological models. So if your parent has an addictive use disorder and you grew up with this, you learned that this is how you are and how you behave and how you cope. And uh, so there's a lot of a lot of ifs here, um, but we do know that there's there are changes in brain chemistry, changes in genetic makeup, and changes in the physiology of you as an individual when you use, when you have a family member who uses, and when you, um, if someone were using while they were pregnant. And I'm saying you, I don't really mean this in the, in the literal sense. I don't, uh, I don't know if any of you struggle with addictive use disorders, but I'm just sort of, this is how I communicate as I'm talking to my computer. Um, okay. Uh, sociocultural models. So similarly, somewhat similarly to the public health model, um, that this 
posits that uh, our view as a culture uh, impacts and affects addiction. So how do we view substances? How do we treat it? Do we treat it with this social stigma, which of course we do, um, even though we try not to? Um, do we isolate people still? Do we shun them? Is there, uh, is there a, a collective cultural way of viewing addiction that precludes it from evolving in a way that is healthier and a better way of treating it? Um, and, and, and so this is what it, this is what the sociocultural model posits. An interesting bit along those lines is that there are other countries who treat addictive use disorders very differently than we do. Um, and Portugal, for example, has a very loose view and a very progressive view on substances and addiction. And basically, um, nothing is really illegal. It's choice. If you, you are in control of your own body. And the thought is, is that if things are not labeled as illegal and penalized in a way that we Americans penalize uh, substances, then the drive and the motivator isn't necessarily there as strong, but it also frees up space and money for treatment. Um, so do some more research on that if you're interested in it, but it's um, there's a lot of validity to this as well. Um, continued, I'm, uh, uh, I'll let you read all that, um, but again, um, you know, the, that um, Different cultures and, and even different ethnicities, as you can see here, have a way of viewing addiction and addiction treatment that can preclude us viewing it in a different light, which would result in us treating addiction in a different way. So multi-causal models, um, and this is, this is uh, if you haven't picked up on this already, just in this brief little chapter, this says no single model explains addictions. There's no one way to say, this is why you have an addictive use disorder, and this is how you treat it. And essentially, it just says that a lot of these models have very strong arguments for explaining addiction and the etiology of addiction and how you treat addictive use disorders. Um, and so we're going to kind of pull from all of those and apply those um, multiple ways of explaining addiction into, into, the, into the explanation of etiology. Um, and, and really, that's, that's probably the best way of explaining it right now because we know so little. Again, there's very limited research in this area and not a lot of funding. And then the, as, a, as a culture, so the United States is a, as a country and, a, and our culture is still very much rooted in um, Christianity and more, you know, that sort of moral idea. And we use the justice system a lot to, <laughs> excuse me, we use the justice system to deal with problematic individuals particularly when we don't know how to address their problematic behaviors. And so this certainly comes into play when we talk about addiction and drug possession charges and drug laws and um, all of these things that we think we set up to help individuals, but oftentimes end up hurting them um, because, of course, we know um, there's not a lot of options for treatment. Um, that's slowly changing. We're slowly evolving because we are having conversations about how did addiction and addiction, addictive use disorders come to be? Um, but, um, you know, we still very much have this traditional way of looking at addictive use disorders and treating addictive use disorders. And sometimes that does fall back in some of those early ways of thinking and early approaches. Um, so read the chapter, listen to this, um, well, you've already listened to this lecture because you're at the end of it, um, and then you've got a, an assignment, and it's a reflective discussion assignment, so it's a discussion post that I want you to read the book, listen to this lecture, and then respond to, I think there's like three or four little prompts, you know, statements that will prompt you in your discussion. There's no uh, sentence limit or max or minimum, um, just write. Um, so just tell me what you think. Okay, bye.